do it. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our YPN Connect uh, about team building and also just business building. And we have a few legends on the call today, which I will introduce later on. Wanted to get started and introduce myself, Colin Dart, chair of YPN. And then we have Tom Tuis, which will be moderating the conversation. I really want to encourage those of you that are on the call, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box. Tom will be monitoring that. We will be peppering in questions as they come. We want this to be as interactive as Zoom call can be. Um, and I, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of good questions based on the panelists that we have here. Uh, also, wanted to touch on Fair Housing Month. April is Fair Housing Month. And I was reading a little bit about this from the NAR website, which I think, I think it's a really good takeaway, which is, and I'm going to read it verbatim. Every April, realtors commemorate the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 with events and education that shine a light on housing discrimination and segregation. Fair Housing Month signifies a recommitment to expanding equal access to housing. Implicit bias is often a manifestation of muscle memory. A go with your gut, unconscious choice, act, or opinion with immeasurable consequences that can and have impacted generations. Slow down, course correct, and take action. Throughout the year, we must remain steadfast in our commitment, breaking down biases, holding ourselves accountable, and upholding the letter of the law. So refresh your memory, open your mind. There's always more to know and we can all do better. I thought that was a pretty nice little excerpt. And you know, we are gatekeepers, stakeholders and what I would say is an inalien inalienable right, housing. So be conscious. There's a lot of leaders on this call and be aware of it, Fair Housing, April. Moving on. Sorry, that was a little serious, but you know, <laughs> kicking it off. <laughs> um, Great, kicking it off with the fair housing. We have our industry partners partner spotlight. This is Christina Fisher with US Mortgages. Want to bring her on to talk a little bit about what she does. Christina. Good morning, everyone. It is so nice to be with you all this morning. Um, I have really enjoyed the DMR Connect meetings, especially with all the challenges that we faced this past year. Uh, my name is Christina, I'm with US Mortgages and I am a loan officer. And I just wanna take a moment and share a little bit about what we do at US Mortgages and what makes us unique. We are a local mortgage lender, so only serving the Colorado community, which helps create that intimate experience and connection when working together. What makes us different is that we will take the time to help your clients. I will guide them through and educate them on the purchase process, really building that relationship and trust with them and you. My goal is to keep the communication and trust open and ongoing. So if they have imperfect credit, they are a first time home buyer or they simply need a starting point, I will help them step by step. But most importantly, I wanna be a resource for you and a support system to help you grow your business. How can we grow together and be a part of something right. bigger? So I am always available that weekdays <laughs> and weekends, especially when agents are out showing homes in this crazy market we are in right now. Um, and knowing the market is critical, especially with all the changes this past year, right. we have to constantly keep up with industry changes. So. Knowing all the mortgage products that are available to your clients and knowing current lending guidelines is extremely critical. So we have 24-hour in-house underwriting and we, I can do same-day pre-approvals to get your borrowers that approval letter for products. We offer conventional VA, USDA, and Jumbo along with non-traditional loans that are gonna help your self-employed borrowers who need alternative ways to qualify. And we also have loans that are flexible to fit unique needs. So, and along with that, we do have credit repair tips and guidance. So 
that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for allowing me to connect with you. Happy Friday. Thanks so much, Christina. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. Christina. Now I get the pleasure of introducing actually a good friend of mine. Um, he's one of the best uh, lenders that I know. He works uh, for, he's a lending advisor at Chase Bank. Um, he's originally from Hawaii, moved to Colorado two and a half years ago, and has been in the lending industry for 17 years. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, when not closing loans, he's dreaming about living in Bora Bora. Uh, this is our annual corporate sponsor, Jay Monticello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Tom. I missed seeing you. We got to hang out pretty soon. Um, you're in. a competitor um, in the lending world. Um, and thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for being in this call this morning. Um, I look a little bit dark. I just came from Hawaii and now I'm um, doing some snow shoveling this morning. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to share with you guys that Chase, um, in connection with Home Story, uh, we came out with a program last year and it's finally gaining some energy um, this year. Uh, we also partnered up with Ryan Sarhat. For those of you who know, he's a very successful real estate agent in the New York City area. Um, and basically this program is to help contribute to the real estate community and helping them grow their business. And as a, a financial institution, what we do is we spend a lot of money in um, running a lot of AUs, algorithms with the existing clients that we have. Um, we're, uh, we're analyzing their um, bank deposits, their income, um, how they're spending their money. We're doing a lot of that stuff. And so basically we're also um, issuing their pre-qualification based on their financial behavior that they have with us. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, we're just sending them emails, text messages, and the way that you're in the program as a real estate agent, um, all the program, our clients goes into the Chase Agent Express program portal. Um, and, you know, they, you, there's three to five agents that are available that they can pick from. One of the benefits for it is you as a real estate agent, you don't have to pay into the program. You just have to enroll. There are some requirements for you. Um, the benefits for our client is they get a $1,000 uh, check after closing. Um, and a lot of times these clients have already been pre-qualified in some cases been fully underwritten. So if you're interested in learning more about the program, I do have a digital brochure. I will um, put my contact information on the chat box. Thank you so much. You guys have a good weekend. Um, take care. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. Um, and now we, I do want to introduce uh, the director of events, uh, Julie Voorhees, uh, with DBAR. Julie? There you go. There I go. <laughs> unmute. I'm telling everybody else to unmute, and I'm muted. Hey, guys. Welcome again to the Connect. We're, real quick, we are going to do our RPAC drawing for those of you who attended the um, Excellence Awards, you know that every year we do a um, RPAC uh, drawing and we're gonna do it today here. So hang on, I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see if we can have a little fun. Can everybody see that? Can y'all hear me? On yellow. Yeah, I can yeah, hear you. Are you hearing me? Yep. We're hearing you. Okay, good. I'm sorry. It's All right, hang on just a second. Then that bad boy. All right. I'm trying to get it so you can hear the cool fun um what it does. <laughs> okay, there we go. I think I got it. You ready? Let's do it. Kristen Miller. Congratulations to Kristen. She just won $2,500 from RPAC. Wow, that is nice. Okay, Excellent. that's it. That's it, okay, great. Thank you, yeah. I was gonna say 100 on red, but I guess that's irrelevant. Um, perfect, well, let's get everyone started. Uh, 
very pleased to invite three legends to the table to talk about their businesses. Brett Weinstein is the founder and CEO of BSW Real Estate. He's ranked among the top 1% of Colorado's highest producing real estate professionals and has completed over 400 transactions since his career began in 2012. Been going after it for a little while. His list of honors and awards began in 2013 when he was named DMARS Rookie of the Year, Brett Weinstein. We have Lori Abbey, owner and CEO of the Abbey Collection. She lives her life with passion, compassion, enthusiasm, and those characteristics drive how she approaches her business. She operates at the top of her field and to provide her friends and clients top level knowledge and service, along with a fun, professional, full service experience on every transaction. And lastly, Andrew Abrams, COO and employing broker at BSW Real Estate, has negotiated over 250 deals for buyers and sellers in the last six years and has helped investors buy over 300 properties during the same time. Andrew is currently a member of the Government Affairs Committee for Denver Metro Association of Realtors, Market Trends Committee, Planning Board member for the City of Denver, and has been on the Blueprint Denver and Affordable Housing Task Force. Welcome to you three. And I think to kick things off, I would love to get a little synopsis of what you sense, what your business model looks like today and how it's evolved over the last few years. Maybe talk about the structure a little bit so we have a context for the audience to then engage with and ask questions. I would like to start with Brett because I know you've got team and a brokerage and would love to hear kind of a little a little bit of a summary on how that model is looking for you today. A little summary, it's looking good. Thank you so much, Colin. Lovely, I appreciate good. your question. Great. Uh, no, so I, I think my model, We I have three basic different ways that we go. Uh, we've got, I do have the brokerage piece, which is great. I also have a team for my personal business. And then I've got a team that is a, a lead-based team. So for some of our, agents that are getting started or for things like that, we, we've got it set up so that I'm having leads go to them and then doing a lot of coaching and training and getting people into a position to have success. And so it's more of a kind of a three-headed monster. Um, although describing any of the people that work with me as monsters would be inaccurate. I think if there was one descriptor of a monster, that would be me. But, you know, I, I, there's a lot of different ways to, to do a team. And so I really wanted to try and tap into all three. Do you want me to dive further? Thank you. No, that's that's perfect. I think we just raised the surface level. Uh, and then Lori, a little bit of a synopsis on where you find yourself today with your, the Abbey Collection. We, um, I had also started a brokerage a, a few years ago and did not enjoy that. The, the whole time that I was there, everybody thought, you know, why, why didn't you just do a team? And so when I moved over, sold my portion of the brokerage and moved over to Compass, uh, some of the people came with me and we, and we started a team. So it, it evolved from doing a brokerage. And the, the point of the brokerage was to be able to share knowledge, bring people in, help lift them up to give them sort of the same lifestyle that I've gotten to build into over the years. So I wanted to be able to do that. But what I realized with the brokerage for me is that it was a lot of paying bills and organizing and, and, you know, even just keeping the lights on and recruiting. And that, that felt like a lot and it didn't serve the purpose that I wanted, which was to be with the people that I care about and wanted to sort of be able to, to, to mentor as, as needed. Um, so we switched over to Compass and since then have been growing the team from there. And it has been growing really organically. Um, we don't go out and look for people on the team People come to us because they like sort of the culture and and the lifestyle and some of the people on the team. So a team was never really a goal of mine, um, but just being to, able to work with people that I like a lot and being able to help each other out was sort of how our team organically grew. Lovely. How many members do you have on your team right now? Uh, Twelve. Twelve. Is that including yeah. assistance? Uh, no, I think with assistants we've got two one COO of the business and then one assistant two assistants so I may have probably 15 total people but as as with Brett I've got my, my own personal business and assistant and COO and then we've got 
uh, the, the team is separate. So I've got a mini team and then the team under the team. Oh uh, yes, this is gonna be complicated today. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Andrew, uh, for you asked to go last because you have a little bit of a different business model. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think the one thing, you know, like listening to you guys, like just I want to remind everyone is the people up here um, probably fail more than anyone else out there. And like the thing is, we just have, we put ourselves out there over and over and over again that you're going to have a lot of losses and you're going to have a lot of things that you want to go well and it doesn't. And I think just like, trying to create as many opportunities is kind of my mindset. And so, you know, when I started into real estate, I didn't have background in anything, um, but really started working with a guy that did a lot of investment properties. So I really worked with investors before doing traditional real estate. So it was very backwards. And so one of the first things I did is I took the head maintenance guy at the apartment building where our office was, and I taught him how to run some fix and flips. And so he's making like 25 grand a year. And I said, Hey, you know what? You just manage the guys. And then when they, you know, don't complete that last 10% of their job, you finish it for them and do it. And so that's the very first team that I built was kind of my construction team. And so when I do a fix and flip, let's say the project takes about three months. It takes me about five to 10 hours of my time over those three months to run a project. And that's why I kind of wanted to start last is because they have traditional real estate teams. And I think enabling kind of a construction and vendors team is incredibly important. And then based off of the investment real estate, I've been able to kind of grow organically um, to do traditional real estate, which I've been on a lot more. And so in, in that team as well, I have an assistant and a buyer's agent. And then like everyone else, I kind of have a bigger team, but mine is a little bit more on kind of like networking and construction focused. So one of our team members is building a, a sixplex um, and we're a little bit all over the place, but I think just that general network of being able to provide help and support to our clients was in the back of my mind, but always with the thought process of like what my hourly is and, and kind of like what the job can kind of look at and traverse. And so that's kind of how I built my team is I have my kind of construction crew I have my specific buyer's agent from like me and my referrals and my assistant, who's kind of a Swiss army knife, and then just a few other pieces as well. That's, that's great. I mean, it's, it's interesting to see how you all have like different paths and then Lori separated from her own brokerage to, to focus on what was, you know, she was great at and passionate about. I'm a little bit curious, actually extremely curious about how things have come together over the years specifically were these team building exercises or building a brokerage was this something you always had in your mind or was this a function of pain points where you're forced to start delegating because of your success or was it something that you had planned the whole time and were strategically putting together plans as you built and grew or is it a kind of a combination of of the two if that makes sense i mean I know that there's a lot of solo agents on the call and I'm wondering in the back of people's minds, it's like, man, I'm, I'm swamped. Should I, should I think about doing a team? And I'm wondering if that was a function that got any of you started or if it was the whole time you knew it was gonna be a team since you started in the business. And I think Brett, I mean, I know you've uh, done a lot of growth in your years in the, in the industry. I'd be interested to hear what your what your path look like? Um, Colin, I've have, I think at the beginning that you said that I, I'm kind of regulated in what I do. And I'd like to just throw out there that I have no idea what I'm doing until I do it. Perfect. Um, <laughs> and, and that's been consistent from day one. And so, no, I had no plans of doing any of the things that I've done. You know, I, I got into real estate, frankly, because I wanted to do something tangible. And my dad said, why don't you try houses? And I said, screw it. And that's my entire story of why I'm in real estate. So it wasn't like this really well thought out plan. Um, you know, with, with getting an assistant, I was meeting with Justin Knoll, who, who does coaching, and he was talking about micro and macro and how you can focus on the big or you can focus on the little. And I had no focus on either. I was just kind of nebulous and all over the place. And it was a good suggestion that I should find uh, someone to help me out because I was doing 60, 70, 80 transactions by myself a year. And 
my organization scheme up until that point was I got a whiteboard and I wrote stuff down on it so that I would not forget inspection objections and inspection resolutions. And that like, that was the extent of my, my, my direction. And so, you know, I think one of the things that you, that you did mention was that um, th this idea of should I start a team or should I do something? I don't think that people, I, in, in real estate in particular, I think we've really made it interesting where we've, for the last 20 years, 30 years, there's this piece of like, everybody goes into their individual offices and does their thing. And that it's, it's this individual basis. And in reality, everything is a lot more fun with other people. And I think in growing a team and growing anything, like it, that's, that's been a big part of it is that like the people that I bring on are people, I don't know, Steve Sims wrote a book, it's called The Art of Blue Fishing. And one of those rules is that don't work with someone who you wouldn't chug a beer with, or we could say, a sh you know, a kombucha or a glass of wine or whatever it might be. But if you can't sit down and chug something with somebody, you shouldn't work with them. But the opposite side of that is that you shouldn't be sitting around waiting to like hiring people or, or doing things by yourself. It's always nice to have that collaboration. And I think that's been a large part of how I got here is like, I don't want to do this by myself. And we can talk about what an assistant has done for me and, and how that helped me to do all of those things. But it, that's been a big piece of it is like, I don't want to do this by myself. And then it grows into collaboration and it grows into more and more. And the team stuff, I mean, Lori just said it, the brokerage, if I was looking to make a ton of money, I would not have opened a brokerage. I could have just done this in real estate. I can be, I can easily do a ton of production and not have to worry about it. But it's, for me, it's much more fun to do it, which is great that I, I'm excited to be on this panel. And I think I tangented like 16 times during that answer. So if you want to direct me back or go to somebody no, else, no. you feel free. No, because I'm going to have follow-ups after that. But I'm, okay, I'm great. The, that helps a lot because I am, I'm wondering if, you know, Lori, at the back of your head, when you started in the real estate industry, you knew you were going to grow as quickly as you did or successfully as you did. And you had in a little kernel in the back of your head saying, this is how I'm going to scale. Or when you scaled, was it a function of, I'm so busy, I can't handle this anymore? Or like a combination of, of those things going on? Or was it kind of organic like Brett's? Yeah, it was, it was, it was very similar to what Brett said. Um, okay. It was, it was, it's a little bit of both or all of the above. Um, there was no point when I started that I thought I would have a team. Um, I could barely make it through the day, didn't understand what was going on. When I started, it was back in the HUD days. And so I was, I was trying to learn to put in blind offers over and over and over again and show up that thousand houses just to get one thing, which is actually, it's kind of come full circle, but in a different way. Um, and so I had no intent of starting a team. Also, like Brett said, though, it, it is much more fun. So Brett is obviously quite a bit more organized than I am because when I got to 30 transactions is when I had to bring in a transaction coordinator and maybe it was about 35 or 36 where I had to bring in an assistant um, because I just, I, I can do 60 or 70 on my own. And so it, it grew that way. And sometimes it was someone going out and showing. So again, our team model is a little bit different because well, different, but similar. We all like to chug beers and wines and shots of tequila together and climb mountains together and do things. So our team is more a function of social events together, helping each other out with showing properties. We, we advise each other all day long. And so our team truly happened organically. There was no plan whatsoever to grow it. It's just all people that we like that like working together. So unlike like Daniel Dixon, he's got a great team model. He pays for leads, brings in leads, delegates them out. They do things from nine to noon. And then from noon on, they do other things. Ours is a lot of independent people working together and and helping each other and having fun so it's 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 different but i certainly like it a lot better than just having been on my own it really really there are people who are good at certain things and people who are great at other things and we all bring those talents together to be much bigger than we would have been individually i think that's awesome thanks Lori, for uh whoops <laughs> thanks for that insights and um hey, yeah, Colin, i can see how I got a question here. Go ahead, Tom. Um, so I was wondering, um, for all three of you, talking about assistance and stuff, I know when I was looking for one, it's really, really hard to find one. Um, and how did you guys find the Swiss Army of assistants? Somebody that checked all the boxes and was able to 
you trust them to get done what you know you could do? I can speak for mine because I finally found one that I like deeply care for and is amazing. But I mean, I, I went through, I had one that I first started when I was not organized at all. That was kind of a Swiss army knife, but that's what her role was, was not to necessarily get me organized, but just kind of fill in the holes and start to create systems. And so I think it depends on where you're at in your own business model. You know, we've kind of talked about systems and the importance of them, because at some point you do have to know when your inspection objection is. And if you have 15 of them, you really need to know when they are. Um, and so like mine evolved from, I think I'm ready to hire. I'm not quite sure. Let me just get someone who's similar to me. That didn't work out so well. Then it was someone who's a little versatile. And now I have someone and her true mission, and it, it feels like kind of, unfamiliar or strange to me that someone would like commit themselves to just like my happiness, but that's her mentality. She's a very positive person who just is committed to, Hey, whatever I need to do to take things off your plate is my mission. And I don't think I realize the value of being surrounded by like such a positive person that is truly dedicated. Like right now she's going to shovel one of the flips that I did because I'm not going to make it up to Broomfield today. And she just went and did that. And I hate managing people. I do not like being a quote unquote boss or in charge of someone. And so it's really fun that she's like self-motivated and, and found someone that is kind of positive and is truly looking out for my needs. And then we kind of break down those systems. Brett's about to disagree. Yeah. Oh no, I was just gonna ask you when the last time you actually went and shoveled regardless. <laughs> That's the only reason to hire an assistant. Come on. And there we go. <laughs> so I, I will say too though like to Colin's first question too I've been really resistant to growing a team I've you know I think being a realtor is is so personal to everyone that you know when you start losing on offers you start to feel like a loser you're when you feel like you get that success and when you start delegating responsibility kind of that that close intimacy you have with your uh clients starts to kind of get diluted. And so that was something that I've kind of been resistant on and I'm still working on because that is an evolution of me kind of being in my infancy of growing a traditional brokerage team. And, and it's, it's a very interesting process, but Brett and I grew up actually down the street from each other, which is why like when we merge companies and are now part of BSW, like it was such an easy process because we've known each other for so long, but he was like, listen, like when you start, stop doing as great of a job for your clients and we all know when we do a good job or not. So when you start not doing as great of a job as you know you can, that is one indicator where you either need to get less clients and choose a higher price point probably, or start building your team. And Abby had kind of, or Lori, sorry, Lori had mentioned um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, she was like at 35 transactions. And then at a certain point, like her business was growing so much she had to, that was kind of that same indication or at least the way I perceived it. So that Lori actually... Have you ever used like a uh, virtual assistant or have any of you ever used a virtual assistant or how do you feel about them? I tried to for like six months and they, you know, one or two things went really well. And then it just, it, it's just not as good. Or at least for me, it wasn't. How about you, Lori? No, uh, -uh. I, I, there's no way I don't, I don't see. And, and he obviously found that out. I don't see any way that you could do that because as you guys were mentioning, it's such an intimate business. Your clients are so connected with you and so need you to guide them to the next step. Somebody not here, not familiar with them, um, not intimate in the way where they've met them. They've, they've been here, th those kinds of things. I just don't see how they could work in this personal of a business. I've tried them not a virtual assistant, but I've used fiber for helping to develop logos and those kinds of things, but not ever where someone could help me help others with, with getting to their goal. Nice. How about you, Brett? I've used virtual assistants and I think that virtual assistants can be extremely successful. You just have to know when and where you want to employ them. Um, and I think that it's, I wouldn't employ a virtual assistant for perhaps with my clients, but I might employ them with reorganizing my CRM or helping me to get letters out or things like that. So it's, I think there's a lot more to it of that. And Tom, I, I do want to go back to your question really quickly. Yeah. You said, how do you know how to hire that person that's a Swiss army knife or that, that's the perfect fit for you? Well, we're in real estate, which means that nine out of 10 of us have no clue what the hell we're doing. 
<laughs> we're independent contractors. And I think that if we're going to talk about assistance and talk about hiring, then we need to make sure that we're accurately describing it. So I'm not organized. That's me. I'm not organized. I'm like 95% of realtors. I'm not organized, which means that I wanted someone who I could like, who's a good person and who's very organized. But I didn't have a specific skill set or things that I was looking for. In our interview, I went through and talked about all of the things that I was that was going on. It was more of me just talking and mind dumping. And it was her name is Ryan Diller. She's fantastic. She's an agent um, right now. And she her response to all of that was like, okay, I was like, so how do you feel like you could help? She was like, well, A, you're clearly not organized. B, here's some of the things that you need to get done. And C, here's this. And I was like, done, hired. So it's not like there needs to be a specific job description. And I think hiring an assistant, one of the best things that happens with that is that it forces me to sit down, especially if it's a full time. And this is where we diverge from that virtual assistant. If I'm sitting down with somebody for 40 hours a week, I have to be organized. I have to sit down. I have to train. So me actually, I didn't have a game plan of what I was doing with hiring that person. But by hiring that person, it forced me to create a game plan. And that's something that we often forget. And I think it's a big holdup for a lot of agents. It's like I, you know, Lori, to, to your point, we feel like we need to be in control of everything. We feel like we need to do everything. And we don't. It doesn't need to be us. Because if it just needed to be us, there wouldn't be any other realtors. We would do it all, right? I don't need all 47 other thousand people. If it's only me who can do this job, then none of you should be here. And that's not the case, which means that I need other people who are going to be phenomenal for my vision who are gonna be unbelievable for my vision and who are gonna work with me to employ and, and impress my vision. And I, I saw some questions in the chat there of like, do I hand off buyers or things like that? Yeah, I, I'll hand off buyers because I trust my team. As long as it's still my process, as long as I'm still a part of it, I can trust my team. But it, that's one of those big things with the assistant is that there doesn't need to be this a magical job description. You can find a great job description for a real assistant, a real estate assistant anywhere, but it, it's not, it can be formulated as much as you want, but you're always going to set yourself up for, for failure as opposed to finding somebody who like you hire someone who you, who's fitting in some of the needs that you have, who you like, who you'd go grab a beer with, who you chug a beer with. I think chugging is very important. Um, <laughs> but that, that's, but that's the right person. That's how you, that's how you start to build. But for those people who are like, Oh, I, I just don't know how to hire who to hire. Sometimes by hiring, that's what creates the solution. So it's not, there doesn't need to be that like specific game plan. That was awesome. Well, Thank you. To, to that end, I'm curious because you all three have built really strong names and brands in our market. And I'm wondering your delegation, you're, you're confident in everyone on your team. Do you have a specific messaging or training that helps that continuation of building your brand and retaining these clients? Or are you fine just delegating off clientele, hope, hoping that they still align that entire experience with you, even though perhaps, and I'm curious about your intake process too. Is it a quick intake where you do a buyer or seller consult and then have a team member take over? Or are you there like bits and pieces along in the process to make sure things are running smoothly? That's a big question, sorry. But uh, Lori, maybe maybe you could touch on that since um, you unmuted yourself. What did I? Okay, good. Well, All right, excellent. Um, so, uh, in terms of the buyer intake, it's it's changed. I think with everything in this business, it changes. You watch the pulse of the business, and it changes depending on the on the on the business. So right now, my buyer intake process is very, very different than it's been in the past. I spend a solid hour, hour and a half lately on Zoom calls, going through with them, really setting them up, setting up expectations, because it is so incredibly difficult out there right now that I don't want them not to understand that. I want to set expectations from the beginning. So I will sit with them and say, you're going to lose over and over again. You're going to want to cry several times. All of these things are going to happen. You're going to get your butt kicked when you think that you couldn't have offered a better offer in all the world. And so I'll spend an hour, hour and a half telling them how difficult it is so that when we do get out there, it actually almost feels easy compared to how I've scared them. In doing that, I have not in the past really handed off buyers much um, because... I, 
I don't know. There, there might be something about me. I, I feel like I'm very laid back and totally relaxed and chill, but I must have some type A control freak personality because I'm not good at handing stuff off because I want it done a particular way. That being said, in this particular market, like Brett said, you know, uh, necessity kind of is the mother of invention. So in this particular market, if we've got six or eight buyers at once, I physically cannot be in six or eight places. I can't drop what I'm doing because you've got to see something in 10 seconds. I can't drop what I'm doing. So part of me setting the expectations in that big, scary Zoom call up front is I will take over the negotiations. I will do those things, but somebody on my team will be available to run out and show you something as it comes up. And so that's been actually really, that's just this new market has helped me sort of toughen up, set expectations and have no choice but to hand some things off because I, I, I have to. That's Did I true. even answer the question? No, that what, was, that what was, was perfect. The That's okay. what, and we're having people <laughs> asking questions in the chat box that are very aligned with your answer so that okay. you answered questions without even knowing they existed. Even right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with all of you, do the members of uh, your team have their own personal business or does everything throw through you guys, like the team leader? And when you do that, how do you... Um, do you talk to the, the, the buyers and then how do you, I want to say transition to somebody on your team, Andrew? Yeah. Um, for the most part, everything's going to flow through me, but I, I think it does depend. I mean, if it's truly to do my marketing and only their sphere, then, you know, they will do the deal by uh, like under their name. I think, you know, the, the teammate or the buyer's agent that I'm working with now, she's younger in the industry and doesn't have as much experience. So I've got her so inundated with kind of like my leads, but similar to Lori, like I feel very relaxed and laid back, but I'm generally always there for the very first showing along with Mariah is the name of my buyer's agent. So like Mariah are always there together, that buyer consult. I have the exact same speech that Lori does, which is this market's going to beat you up. I wish, you know, your vision of what this process is going to look like, which is a white picket fence and you step in a house and your memories and stories are already there. Might be your fifth stories and fifth memories because it's going to take a little while to get there. Um, but I would say the biggest thing too is kind of that quick adaptation. And, and I always say the right house doesn't wait for my schedule. And so, you know, the our biggest thing is to provide the right amount of support. And so, you know, whether it's me or Mariah, we've all trained the same way to view a house the same way. And with me kind of learning construction, I look for like a lot of those really small details, like are there GFCI outlets in the kitchen and bathrooms and, you know, cam lights in those 1950 ranches right above, right? Or are they on a lamp? Like those are really simple things to look for that a normal buyer wouldn't, that kind of sets you up as a professional. And then I bring an iPad to every closing and they fill out a form at the end of every showing. So as soon as they're done, like my client is done seeing the house, that form gets auto emailed to me. And at the end of kind of their process with Mariah, I can call them and say, hey, it sounds like you didn't like any of them or it sounds like you like two of three. Here's where we're at. But because we're able to kind of differentiate our roles, Mariah is showing more for me and me a little bit more behind the scenes. We're able to run comps. We're able to call the agent. And so when I make that call, as soon as they're done, I've given them realistic expectations of, hey, they want to wait till Sunday. This is going above asking or whatever it is. But I actually think it's providing a better customer experience. But I have quite a few clients still that are saying like, no, I need Andrew there with his eyes on it. And that is kind of that transition as I'm kind of growing my team, but I'm more in the infancy of the process of, of a traditional real estate team growth. Whereas Brett's going to give a different answer because he's been doing it longer. Well, and I wanted to pitch it to Brett next because like you said, he has a different model and stuff like that. Same question to you, Brett. Quick refresher of the question. I was listening to Andrew and I just, he's so dreamy. I zoned, I zoned <laughs> out into his eyes. Oh, I, I feel the same way. It, uh, do members of your team have their own personal business um, or do they put the business through uh, you and close in your name, all that stuff? How do you? Okay, have so that, this is a, I'm going to kind of break off then a little bit because I don't have as traditional of a lead based model. Most times that there's a lead based model, everyone works just the leads and that's it. I don't believe in a buyer's agent or a, a listing agent. I believe that everybody should be fully competent as a real estate agent. So I absolutely encourage them to still work with their sphere. I absolutely encourage people that work with us to, it's a leads plus. 
So we have an expectation of how many people you're going to reach out to that are the leads. We also have an expectation of how many people that you should be reaching out to your sphere. And I think that should be for all of us and not to, you know, we don't want to treat our friends and family like they're a business, but in reality, I'd much rather that they remember that I'm in real estate and that they're going to call me because I'm going to do a much better job for my friends and family than somebody else will it is, a, is a strong belief that I have. So I'm totally okay with them working that. Um, I, in kind of just a tangent of, because that's what I do, I tangent. Um, I don't do as many showings at this point. My clients don't have an expectation of me being there. I have very well-trained agents that work specifically with my personal business that can take over and that they fall in love with them and that's okay. And I'm still involved. I'm still making the calls. I negotiate when applicable. If I'm, you know, if there's times when I don't need to, I don't get involved throughout the entire transaction short of checking in and making sure everything's okay. Um, but that's because we've created a training based model. And that, that, I mean, that's part of the, we can dive into the brokerage and why, why I did that. But like, that's one of the big things is that I want everyone in this industry to be proficient. I want everybody, we're, we're on a race to the bottom in real estate right now. And that's where a lot of these, I'm just going to get on my soapbox and then I'll leave it, I promise. But that, all these disruptors, all these things that are happening, it's because we are so, we're working so fast to get to the technology side and to see how much less we can do and to become the Uber of, of real estate. We're just here to open your door. And I strongly believe that if we're very well trained, if we're rising up, if we're getting more and more educated, if we understand the process better and better, then people may still get on Zillow, may still get on Redfin, may still get on all these different websites, but they're still going to call me because I'm the expert. And so um, it, th this training and making sure that people are very well educated, I think it allows a lot more flexibility within even the lead based team. So I don't need to have them just focus on leads. I want them to focus on everything because I have no fear putting them in front of any person. Nice. That's amazing. That that segues to maybe a sensitive question, but maybe not. I'm curious what you perceive is your core competency or what you are most proud of that your business does that you think you do better than anyone else. If you if you have one or if you're working on one. I'll start. Yes. I'm gonna. I want to back up real quick to the the team thing just for one second, and then you'll maybe have to remind me of this question. Everybody on my team does their own business. We are not a lead based team. We are an independent group of people who come together to share information, to climb mountains together, to have happy hours together, to you know help each other show when needed, advise, share contractors. So my team is is really more of a group of friends that have come together and we all help each other out and it's it's more of a culture than anything else. Should we do more training and more of those things? Absolutely. At this point in our lives, I don't see any time for that. But just, just to know there's other team models out there, you could be a part of a team without it being a lead-based team. So when we set ours up and when I meet with people, I say right off the bat, and we've, we've not gotten many people on the team because they say, I want leads. And I say, I actually will say, We'll call Brett, call Daniel Dixon. These are people where you're going to sit there and do it a little bit differently and you're going to get leads. If you're with us, you're just part of, of our culture. So that's that's just backing up to that, just to clarify that ours is a little bit different. Um, in terms of our core competency, I think that, I don't know if this is a, really a competency, but I think one, I'll say that I, and I'm sure everybody that's on this call feels the same way, but I just feel like, my knowledge of and my pulse on what's going on, on every house, on what percentage things are going over asking, on what it takes to win. Um, I think I, I would want a family member, like Brett said, I would want a family member, a friend of mine working with me because I would trust that they have someone who cares about them and looks out for their needs, but who knows a lot and who's not gonna miss something along the way. So I think knowledge and connectivity or being connected is something that I bring to the table. Um, and then we like to do that with a little bit of fun. I, I think almost every review that you read of mine is that we took great care of them, treated them like a multi-million dollar client, even if it's a $400,000 client, and we made the process fun and less stressful. So I think that that's sort of where we like to go. Our core competency is knowledge combined with just a little bit of fun, trying to take the stress out and make it uh, make something difficult a little bit less difficult. I'll jump in. Yeah, please. Thanks, Andrew. Um, 
you know, like I, I would say, like I've really tried to every single year of my career, like become really good at something new. So the first two or three years was probably learning like investment real estate. And then another year or two was actually like traditional real estate, which again is very backwards, but it was very, you know, when you write investment contract, most of the time I don't have an inspection object, any inspection terms, it's just like title deadlines, closing deadline, here's your money. And so it was like, oh man, people actually need to be protected. It's not just scraping something. But, um, you know, I, I would say, I, I also really try to be kind of like a pit bull, you know, like pit bulls can be very lovable, but then likewise too, like when it's time to turn that switch on or think about just what the industry does as a whole, what can I do that fits somewhat within that model that's a little different? So I use Tom as my lender um, and I don't ever let Tom call the listing agent unless the listing agent specifically asks for it. And again, that might be one of those control issues, but I want control over the whole process because no offense to like lenders, but most lenders want to build relationships with everyone so everyone can use them. And all I want is what's best for my client. And so like when I think what's best for my client and I want to start pushing for different concession amounts or strategize throughout the process, I, I know how those conversations have gone and how, you know, I might ask for something or say something that means nothing in that conversation, but I know what it's going to mean a day or two from then and how I kind of set that up. And so if someone else calls, it kind of throws that off a little bit. So I always feel like I'm in control of my process and knowing when to kind of flip that switch on and when not to. And so that's something that I've been really proud of. Obviously, like I'm the chair of the market trends committee. So I have a really good pulse on what's going on in the market. But realistically, the market is a big picture, nice thing to talk about to pick up clients. It doesn't really protect your clients when they're ready to buy a house because it's an individual house on an individual circumstance where you're really learning not to just like compete against the seller, but the 15 other buyers and what you need to do to get there. And so I think once you have that kind of formula, it's building those relationships and it's kind of thinking a little bit differently than everyone else. So that's something that I've really tried to pride myself on and I'm still growing in, but this industry is always changing. So as it changes, you know, I think I have the ability to adapt and I think that's something that I'm, I'm proud of. Thanks, yeah. Andrew. And then Brett, if you would have a moment to touch on what you're most proud of other than advertising on NPR, which I love. I uh, thank you for saying that. I use self <laughs> self deprecating humor like a weapon. Um, that's my core competency. So. <laughs> no, I, I very most, good. most proud of. I, I yeah, that's, I, I recommend it, guys. If you can do a lot of self deprecation, it really works out for you well in the real estate industry. Um, education. Education is the big one. I, I think like a lot of people, I came into this industry and was told there was all these things that people were going to give me and teach me and, and help me. And I knew absolutely nothing. And I, I don't feel like I was very well trained when I got in. And I know there was classes, but there was no real life experience. And so it took me trying to figure it out on my own. And I think had there been better classes for me up front, I may not have been in the same position that I'm in right now, but I instead had this drive to get educated and to learn as much as I possibly could as quickly as possible. Um, and I recognize that being able to talk real estate, which Lori is phenomenal with, Andrew's phenomenal. There's a ton of people that are phenomenal with it, but really understanding it backwards and forwards like they do uh, gave me a huge leg up and then making sure that if I could teach that coach that, that then people could be great in and around. And I think that that's been one of the biggest pieces is just with education. Killer. Uh, just a little brief touch point is it seems like you're really fostering an environment for pretty powerhouse agents to be growing beneath you. Do you feel like the end goal for you is to retain these agents or do you, are you happy and proud when they go out on their own and do their own thing? Is, is, are you trying to keep these people under your umbrella? Or is it, I saw I mean, the question. You... Like, uh, the question being, do I want to keep them on my team? I don't care. Okay. We have a brokerage and they're more than welcome to move from the team to the brokerage. And if people feel like they need to grow past the brokerage or if they, I, I will never be the person that ever feels like I'm holding somebody back. So I'm okay with having, there's always more people that want to work leads. There's always more room for people to do that. There's always more education to be had. There's always more places to get better. So if somebody outgrows it, then they outgrow it. 
I don't want to have a model. And I know that this is different from a lot of lead models out there. And I've noticed in some of the chat, people are used to like this high production. You stay on the team for forever. If someone loves the team and they're doing an amazing job and they're building a business and they're very comfortable with the hours that they're working and how it looks, by all means, they can stay there for forever. But if you grow and you learn and you feel like you've, not, you know, you've graduated from it, well, we have a brokerage. And I know that not everybody does that. So I don't have to feel like they need to stay yeah. with me for forever. But I, I don't think it's ever mattered. You know, Maddie, Maddie Kissel, who's on here, worked, worked with me for years and she's phenomenal and she graduated. She was, she's amazing and she's now just this unbelievable rock star, but she chose to go to Compass and I could not be more proud of, of her to make that decision and her, what she's doing right now. And nor would I ever, you know, poo poo on Compass. I think it's an amazing company, but it's that piece of, I never want to be someone that will hold somebody back. And I think it's really important to be authentic to that piece. Now, was I secretly a little bitter? Of course, because I think Maddie's amazing. But at the end of the day, like, I don't want to be a roadblock or a hurdle for somebody. And I think that that's a view that I want to have for the team. The team still works. I can still find new people for it every single day. And I still educate and help them to grow. Sorry, Andrew, cut me off. And sometimes I, I think all three of us have been like, oh, well, we're not that organized. I think there's another way to say that too. And it's that the business is always changing and to reorganize your systems and structure for what works. And as soon as that shift happens, like this market with like historically low inventory, all of a sudden you feel less organized or I felt watered down because instead of getting rid of four or five clients a month by them buying, you just hold them. So like the amount of buyers I have has just gone up every month. And so, you know, to Brett's point too, like for my team, because I have my buyer's agent assistant, and then I actually have four other team members and they are able to grow. And I'm hoping that it's like, you know, the team name is Abrams Momentum Group, but it's the thought process on that is not as much on, on the monetary leads. What can I make off of you? And somewhat of, of Lori's too, right? It's, it's that culture piece, but also that growth of education. So I brought a builder on my team. I, I brought the guys who ran the fix and flips for Zillow. Um, I brought just a close friend of mine that is a professional beer chugger. And then I brought someone who's part-time and kind of wants property management and she's all over the place. So like my team is not like a put together well-oiled machine. I have my two people that are like, feel like that well-oiled machine, but as they grow, I'm really hopeful. And I think they've bought in in a very short amount of time that it's that community that we've been able to build together that no matter what happens and how things change, we'll be able to adapt for it. And so I think that's kind of my approach is we still want that high touch with clients. We still want to provide a great service and we all need to make money. And I think that's one thing that hasn't been spoken as much is this, you know, it's nice to be in real estate and do good things for people. People also have to make money and that's okay. And so the question is, how can you do that while raising the bar in our industry? And I think that's where like Brent and I are very aligned on, on kind of some of that mission statement for our company. Right. And I did want to piggyback off that uh, answer for all three of you. When you do have a team and you're delegating stuff to them, um, how do you determine their compensation of a team member? Is it a percentage of the deal? Do you get a percentage? Is it per showing? A lot of people in the chat room are wondering how to set that up or how you guys do it. How do you do it, Lori? I do it differently depending on, again, the situation. So a lot of times I only need help showing and I'll, I'll do $50 per showing and, and send people out $50. And then if it's all in one area, I'll do 50, 25, 25. And if they have to go to another area, it's 50. Or if I call them last minute and they need to go show something in Golden, I might offer, I might throw something out in the chat say, hey, a hundred bucks for anybody who can go show this property for me. So if it's just a showing, I will pay it by showing. If I've got so many things going on at once that I need to delegate an actual buyer to somebody, then I will do 50-50. Um, I'll, I'll still take over because I, I like to. So I'll still take over with the phone calls and the, and the writing offers and those kinds of things. But if I have to delegate out a buyer just because I need them to be available and to go to the inspection, et cetera, I do 50-50 on that. Wonderful. How about you, Brett? Um, I overpay everybody. That's, that's my, that's my strategy for, for everything. Um, no, I mean, it's, I have different things that I've done, but in starting out people that were helping with just doing showings, I would pay them 10% of the refer of the commission. If they ended up having, helping with writing the contract or negotiations, I would do 25%. 
Um, if it's somebody who's working with the lead all the way through, it's always 50-50. Um, and that, that's for my personal business as well. For our lead team, we have it broken up. We have an ISA that's calling and scheduling appointments. So for them, it's 40-60 because we're paying for the ISA with that. If it's a lead that they convert on their own because we send a lot of the leads to them, we do 50-50. With the leads that they're bringing in, it's 60-40. So if they get their own sphere in that piece and it speaks to, we want to reward you for growing your own business and we want to pay you to graduate. And if you decide that you are comfortable with those splits, then great. If not, then there's a graduation metric. But, you know, I think the, the splits, you know, the team in general is that you're fulfilling a need, right? So we're looking for great people to fulfill specific needs for us. And that's for Andrew, for Lori, for myself, that's what we're looking for. And so it's trying to figure out who are the people what do we need to do to make sure that they're going to be able to make money, that they're going to be able to be successful? Because I think for all three of us, the one thing that we never want to hear is I really need to get this deal completed. I have to get this deal done. Because when people start saying that and there's that desperation for cash, that's where we, that's a big part of our, the issues that we run into in this industry. I'll, I'll talk my clients into it. And so making sure that we have enough. And so sometimes splits can adjust upwards if we feel like we can better support somebody. 100%. No, that's that's amazing. How about you, Andrew? And mine's the similar, Brett. The one thing I don't think that's been touched on is like that assistant role or something like that. So, I mean, I had offered 40 to 50 grand um, as kind of that role. But I also, I mean, when I have a big month, nothing makes me happier than giving bonuses to her. And like bonuses look in different ways too, because again, with that culture and, and kind of pieces, like I told her like, we should start going in the office two or three days a week. And she was like, ah, I don't really love that. And I was like, okay, well maybe we'll go one day a week, but we'll see. But like she, she crushed, right? Like the fact that she's shoveling right now or something like that. I gave her an extra just day off for no reason. Just like go enjoy. Like she loves to ski the seasons almost end. And then like is on our way up to the resort. Like I Venmo her 20 bucks and just say, Hey, first two beers are on me. I mean, it's $20. That is not like that much of a gift or bonus, but just that thought of, Hey, I want to support you in your life. You know, I'm always telling like anyone in my team, go on vacation. Like, and it, you know, everyone's like mid 20s. So it's like, go on vacation as much as possible. Cause for me with my two young kids and my hairline used to be right here, like you need to travel and enjoy life and kind of find that balance. And so I think when kind of the combination, both of Brett and Lori, cause I kind of built my team off of Brett's model. And I think that was a big reason for our merger is, he's so good at knowing how to kind of fit the person with how the team should grow. And so I was like, okay, well with the traditional brokerage that way, but just like, what is that community and culture piece that gets people to stay and has that value? So that's kind of been my focus, but I think that the splits are the same, the 25% for showing 50% for that, but then also my assistant, that's kind of her price range as well. Well, and, and on my team, because of the way Compass pays, um, I do take a little bit of, uh, of a split from everybody on my team. So everybody does their own business, but I take anywhere from five to 20% off of each of their closings, depending on how much experience they have. So newer people that have come on the team that call me every day and ask questions and need help writing offers and need me to look everything over, they're kind of getting, they're, they're, they're giving up 25% for that. But as they grow and as they ask fewer questions, then it gets to where I'm just taking 5% just for being part of the team. So I do get a little percentage off of everybody. That's, that's a reason. And then back to whether they would leave or not, um, I would want them to. If, if that feels good for them and they feel like they can go out on their own and make more money and do better, that's all I care about. That's all I want. Because my money isn't being made off of the team. That's just sort of a bonus for me for time that I'm giving to share information. Great. great. Yeah, thanks for the answer, guys. Switching gears a little bit, I was, and since we're getting close towards the end, if you were going to put yourself in your shoes two years in, three years into your career, and then have the opportunity to look back at all your successes, failures, what you've been through. Is there one thing or something you would do differently, change, or is there a piece of knowledge that you've gained that you would write, you would like to share with that former self if you had just like one thing to bring back when you first started? I would have dedicated two things. I mean, one is some people told me to get rentals early in your career. 
Um, and I didn't listen until a little later. And so like, I've got some, but had I bought one a year from 2010, when I got my license on, um, I probably wouldn't be on this call. I'd be in Hawaii. Um, so, I mean, I think and, and dedicate to systems. I'm not a systems guy, not naturally, um, but I've kind of learned to be one in the last year and a half. And once you do it, it's actually kind of fun um, because at least the way mine flows is like those forms fill out, you understand what's going on, you kind of figure out where to put it. And so you feel more put together. And I didn't, I still don't have a real sphere list. I literally just put one together last month after being in the business for 10 years. Um, I've never done marketing. I've never reached out to anyone. I've literally done the least amount possible outside of be very social and know what I'm talking about. And so, you know, like I'm not, I mean, you know, Lori and Brett are both 40 million. I, I did a little over 20 million last year um, for the traditional real estate side, but like, you know, that's all just been, so I think if I had done that at the beginning, I think, oh man, where could I be? Maybe I could be Brett. Um, but I think that those would be the two big pieces of advice. And then I think the thing that did get me to where I am again is kind of like putting yourself out there for the education and opportunity. You know, I was on the government affairs committee. I ran to be vice chair. I lost, the guy quit. So then I became the chair. I ran to be market trends committee. It came down to a tie. I flipped a coin, tails never fails. Now all of a sudden I get to be the chair. So those were not like these glamorous, great stories of how I just like was all the best and I deserve these roles. Like I lost everything I ran for, but continued to put myself out there and that created opportunity. And then I took advantage of that. So instead of feeling bad for myself, I was like, oh man, you know what? Great, let me be the first loser every time and take advantage of that and then like go in there. So that's been kind of my mindset. And I think that's gotten me to kind of help where I am. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Brett, what do you think? Looking back at your years in the industry, what would you share Looking with back you? at my years in the industry, well, Andrew said that if he had gotten organized, I have not been organized and I still don't have an effective CRM list. Um, just it's, it's not something I've ever done. I'm not good with following up with my clients. I, I have a lot of people that help me to do all that stuff. I've, I'm just not, that's never been a strength. And I don't know why it's so hard for me to call past clients. Um, I do, but like, it's very, very rare. And it's more because we do a ton of events. And so I'll invite them to events, but I just have a hard time with like the loving follow-up that I, I see so many people do two to three years. in, I, in my first year in real estate, I was able to do 26 transactions. I wish that there had been someone to tell me at that point to hire someone. I wish that there had been someone at that point, I two to three transactions a month, you should have hired somebody. Yep. I mean, and I, I think that people say that, the, the, well, what if I can't afford it? Just by virtue of hiring somebody, you'll be able to afford it. It's, it's the scariest leap. And I can tell you that I went into it thinking, oh my God, I'm hiring someone. I'm going to go broke. I'm not going to be able to pay them. And it was the greatest thing that I've ever done. And you could hire the wrong assistant and still do just fine. And it, like, it, it, you'll grow into it and you'll figure it out. But I wish that I had hired someone in year one, because what if there had been someone who had held me accountable? What if, there, what if there had been someone who was there to, to help me grow from year one? And what if I had gotten good habits instead of all the bad habits that I have? You know, I'm just going to do a correction. You said that I had done 400 transactions at the beginning. I think in, in the now nine years in real estate, I'm closer to like 700 to 800 at this point. Yeah, um, it's an, it's an, it's an old bio. But it's, it's that piece of like, and, and I don't say this as a pat myself on the back. We're on a call about teams and assistants. So what if I had actually been organized and put it all together early? I don't know where I'd be, but I know that it would be substantially further along than I am right now. And so that would be the biggest piece of advice is like, God, I didn't have to do this by myself and none of us do. And I think that in real estate, the idea that we're the only one who can do that something is just ridiculous. I think it is so, so important to have somebody there who can support your vision, make sure that you're great at what you do and to hold you accountable. You don't pay somebody for 40 hours a week and then never speak to them. And if you do, then that's the wrong assistant or you're not in a place to have an assistant. So um, I, I think that's, it's just, that would be a really good reminder. I just saw where do you find your assistant? You can find them in a million different places. You can get on wise hire. You can post on social media. Again, it's someone that you want to chug a beer with. So it doesn't always have to be a stranger, but I don't think it's the best thing ever to have it be your best friend. But I think there's a lot of people who found a lot of success with that. So you just kind of look, um, but that, that piece of like, 
I, I just, I can't imagine what the difference would have been. I was going to say, I, I, uh, I found one assistant um, as, a, as a server. So if you've got somebody who treats people nicely and, and seems organized and together and asks the right questions. And uh, so, I mean, I, you could find them anywhere. It, and more often than not, uh, they may not, there's not a ton of people who have been in the real estate industry for a long time that have lots of experience, or if so, they're going to be, they're going to cost you over a hundred thousand dollars. So start with somebody that has a personality and a skill set, and, you know, you can go that direction as well in terms of the, the skill or the, what I wish I would have done is very similar to what Brett said. What I wish I would have done um, back then was hire earlier for some of the things that I was missing. So I think that the earlier you can figure out what your skill is and what you're best at and spend more of your time doing that, the happier you're going to be, the, the, you're going to burn out a lot less because you're busy doing the things that bring you joy that you're great at. And then you delegate some of those other things off and it, it, it helps you specialize a little bit. I think, I think that's uh, so I definitely would hire early and there's not been one time that I've hired. I've not loved all my hires and we've often had to fire and that's fine, but there's not been one time where it didn't make my life a little bit easier and allow me to go do more of the things that I'm good at. If you've got me out there networking, talking on the phone with other agents, looking at things, meeting with people, having fun, I'm bringing in clients that we can all share money off of. Um, whereas if I'm behind the scenes doing assistant stuff or transaction coordinating, by the way, TC, having a transaction coordinator is something, if you have more than 10 transactions in a year, I think you need a transaction coordinator. It is, it is heavenly. That actually you on track. My, my next question on when do you think uh, Brett said uh, one to two, or sorry, two to three deals a month uh, would get an assistant. When do you each think bringing on an assistant would be beneficial um, and bringing on a TC would be beneficial? Where do you draw that line or, or where did you guys draw that line? We'll start uh, first trip. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I was going to say, I think TC immediately i mean just another yeah. set of eyes on a contract yep. and someone to help and support just you know just as a catch if they're just not so expensive for the commission you're getting to provide again kind of that better value the way i have it set up with my tc she does this great intro email she sends the contract to the lender and title right away i mean just even for those you know that to be on that so i can focus on making sure they're comfortable with the process is really great. Um, and then, you know, kind of like when you hire that assistant role is, is a little more subjective, but I, I think that TC component is so important right away. And I tried to not hire an assistant for a long time because I just wasn't, or uh, yeah, for a long time. So that's why I tried a virtual assistant is what could I get automated in an email form to my clients or even leads. I, I think I went through ZBuyer and then I had them all filtered into our like CRM database and then had an internal sales agent that's that ISA to call. Um, so I tried all these workarounds for really cheap ways to get leads filtered in. They're fine. They weren't great. Um, and that's where the kind of that touch approach and having it be a personal business, um, I think, has a bigger impact. Perfect. How about you, Brett? Scarcity mindset versus a mindset of abundance, right? Your first transaction oh my God, it's $300, $400, $500 and I'm paying a transaction coordinator. Oh my God, well, I'm going to do another transaction because I'm going to get better and better at this. So I would hire a TC from transaction number one. We are so concerned with our money. We're so hyper concerned with, with the cash. It's okay to pay other people. It's okay to make your life easier. And, and it, it allows you to get to a position of growth so much quicker. So there's that piece of that scarcity mindset of like, oh my God, it's $400 and this is all stuff I could do by myself. That's great. But having you out there, having you be who you're supposed to be learning, educating, involved in the transaction, but not in a way that you're man managing the day to day is so, so, so important. So I would I'd TC forever, you know, TC for life. <laughs> Same with you. What do you think? Right off Did you TC? Did you just ask me? I couldn't, I, it cut out for a second. Did you say yeah. Lori? Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'd say TC from the very beginning. Now, the only disagreement I would have on that is that 
the reason if it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm still doing inspection objections and resolutions and those kinds of things, I can't expect my TC to be staying up that late for negotiations. So the only thing I would say is I was glad that I waited a couple of years to hire my TC so that I knew how to do everything myself so that there's no point on a weekend or late at night or three o'clock in the morning or whatever that I can't come in and do it as well. I don't want to do it, but I want to be able to do it. Hey, Lori. So I'd I'll say early you, on, but not until you know stuff. I'll bet you $20. I'll bet you $100 that those people that you're waiting till 1130 at night and those agents, the listing agents and buying agents who don't return any phone calls, I'll bet you a hundred bucks, none of them have an assistant. Because if that they might... had an assistant, they wouldn't be working at 1130 at night where you and your assistant and your team are following up consistently and they never get back to you till 1130. That's why you build it. Yeah. So you, we should call those people and make sure that they're on the next one of these. Yes. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Exclusive oh, really? invite. Yeah. All right, I, I love it. That is that is good to know because I'm clearly doing something wrong because the quantity of nights in a week that I am up still negotiating things till 11, 11.30 at night is really high, like at least three or four nights a week. Now, maybe it's just this current business, but it's, uh, I'm obviously, I need to learn from you. Brett, we're going to sit down separately because it doesn't sound like you're out doing that late at night. God, no. Well, Lori, I can't wait. Just uh, bring Lynn, bring your mom. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> well, everyone, we have to wrap up. It's on to the next. Brett, Lori, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing the depth of knowledge. Uh, I had some great takeaways personally. I need to hire an assistant like tomorrow. Um, and, and really appreciate you joining us. I think we're going to jump on to our next part of the meeting, which will be the marketing component. Um, thank you all. Stay on or jump off, whatever, and we'll, we'll keep it moving. Yeah, thank you. This Thanks, was Brett. Thanks, awesome. Lori. Uh, we Thanks have, for thank having us. So that much. was fun. Legends. Legends. All right. And now we are on to marketing. Oh, excuse me. I'm gonna do some announcements. My apologies. Uh, we have a Meet Your Industry Partner event coming up Wednesday, April 21st at 9 a.m. This is going to be a free event for realtors looking to build their team and industry partners looking to make connections. These are such good events. You can get a bunch of referrals from a lot of vendors. I encourage everyone to attend. The next Connect is going to be a Community Alliance Committee sponsored event. That's going to be next May 21st at 9.30. And then lastly, we have our YPN New Development Insider. And this is going to be coming up in, oh, Jessica's asking what date. Uh, this is going to be coming up in June. I think it's June 22nd. This is going to be the first in-person DMAR event that is being held. It's going to be socially distanced, of course. Mile High Station, new developments. We're going to have a bunch of different developers in-house, a lot of different tables showing off new development in Denver and surrounding. It's going to be a little different this year because we're going to have boutique single family developers, townhomes, and condos. So it's going to be really excited, exciting to, to have an in-person event. And then lastly, uh, that is all the announcements that I have. We're going to be in starting the marketing portion of the, the program. And Jennifer, if you could jump on, please. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Oh, all right. So first it looks like we have Kara Riley up and she has two new listings to share with us. Oh, thank you very much. What a great program. I just, first of all, want to say thank you for all that input and it was very positive. So now this listing in Thornton is 495,000. It's a screaming deal um, because it has four bedrooms upstairs, a three car garage, that fire pit in the backyard, it was 20 grand uh, five years ago. And it will. this will start showing tomorrow and it's 2,100 square feet plus 900 square foot finished basement with um, a three quarter bath. So you have extended living area if you need it. And uh, 495 is the lowest price in 
um, Signal Creek in that it's about 131st in Colorado Boulevard. So it will have showings for two days, Saturday and Sunday, and uh, contracts by Monday at noon and answers by Tuesday at six. So they have a steam shower closed in there. So they've done some uh, interesting things. So. There's a basement finish, three quarter bath. We even have a COVID station. Oh, the um, community center has a covered kiddie pool. So there you go. Uh, and the HOA fee is 500 per year, which is pretty cheap for the beautiful um, clubhouse they have. Now this just came on the market two days ago, 5.12 acres in Berthoud in a luxury home area. There's a $70,000 water tap fee already paid. So um, you're all set to develop. It's flat land, um, it's beautiful mountain views and um, easy access. We may even have a perk test. We're looking at it from when they bought it originally for septic. We've I've got the um, current, Covenants uploaded in MLS plus the home design approval um, drafts. So you're all set. Thank you for allowing me to pitch. Great. It looks like you've been busy. Um, Ann Harrison Hicks. Um, I'm not sure if you're on the call, but um, if you're here, did you want to talk about your listing? Okay, well, if you are here, then we'll um, catch you after Paula. So Paula, do you want to tell us about your new construction? Sounds like they've moved on. All right, well, All there right. are the MLS numbers if anyone wants to check them out. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't oh. mute myself. Sorry, I forgot oh. we were not, that we were muted, but I wanted to say to Brett and Andrew, it was wonderful to listen to you. And I remember you before you were Brett and Andrew. And, um, and Laurie, it was nice to get to meet you on this meeting. Um, this is um, fabulous new construction. Anybody who's seen some of the product that I've marketed over the last couple of years knows that it will be awesome when it's finished. And I think it's kind of cool because we're building a Victorian. So we've got old charm with brand new everything. It is 2068 square feet, three bedrooms, three, uh, three bathrooms, and a main floor study, and a detached two-car garage. Um, 9.55 at the moment, um, so I would say whoever is going to buy it is going to get it at a bargain if they buy it now, because who knows where we'll be by the middle of the summer. Thank you. Perfect. Do we have anyone else? Jennifer? No. Those were the only ones that cool. I saw on the spreadsheet, but um, let me just double check the chat. Nope, I don't see any others. Great. Well, I want to say thank you to everyone so much again for attending. Hopefully you got some takeaways. I sure know I did. It's time for me to hire an assistant, I believe. Uh, thanks. As, as on behalf of YPN, thanks for joining us. And next connect will be uh, next May 21st. We'll see you then, if not before. And take care. Have a nice snowy day out there, everyone. Thanks for putting this together. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Appreciate you.